we're from today are from places like Brazil, uh, you know, Colombia, where traffic is you know, murderous, might be a word that you want to use. Like, it's really challenging. And so people say, hi, you're, you're, bring, you know, you're, you're bringing experts from these places to talk about accessibility. What do we have to learn from them? Well, you know, we share problems, we share heritage, we share solutions, right? And there's so much innovation in places that we visit. We always come back inspired. And, we, and the inspiration comes from every level. It comes from our meetings with high elected official. It comes from meeting with people in the streets. There's just nothing like getting to be there in person, right? So we're so thrilled to bring you this discussion of mobility and access today because it really is around equity. And we built that conversation off of what we learned in those places. So I think today is going to be a really phenomenal discussion with city planners and policymakers about how we really can catalyze mobility and, and drive solutions to the people who need them. So really grateful to everybody who's helped us put this together. I know that there are some committee members who helped build today's panel. If you're, if you're on the committee, you wave and be acknowledged. Everybody give a hand for the, these folks. These are the folks who made it all together. So thank you. We appreciate it. I also want to mention, uh, you know, we couldn't do this without the support of so many sponsors. And this particular session is sponsored by the Denver Office of Economic Development and Opportunity, newly renamed DADO. Did I say that right? Yeah. DADO, thank you. I'm getting there. Uh, and then on behalf of the city, I'd like to bring up Eulis Plucky to say a few words. Thank you for that introduction and invitation to uh, give some opening remarks here at uh, this particular Clinica uh, which is the uh, Turning Off the Ignition Discussion on Mobility and Access and Equity. Uh, so I almost had a mobility issue right there from stepping up because I have bad knees from being a former athlete. Uh, so I can definitely appreciate uh, making sure that we have all of our infrastructure set up in a manner that uh, no matter whose ability that runs across that infrastructure can be able to move around. So, uh, so I'm Ulysses Cleckley, I'm the Executive Director of Denver Public Works, and I'm uh, definitely proud to represent the city for this uh, session, being one of the sponsors of the event. And uh, I, I want to spend the time to uh, today learn from a lot of the different voices here, not only in the panel, but uh, perhaps in the crowd, uh, about ways in which uh, we can build a more equitable city. So I'm very excited to be here and very excited that this is an actual topic as a part of this particular event this year. Uh, and so I I've been uh, at the Public Works Department for almost two years. Uh, I came in at the uh, end of 2017. Uh, we have a, a burgeoning city, as you know, here in Denver. We've added over 100,000 more residents uh, to the city and county of Denver uh, over the past seven years. Uh, and with more people and more jobs comes more impact to our transportation system. And so we're trying to figure out ways uh, to make sure that we include equity into everything that we do. Uh, now equity and transportation equity is traditionally a planning term. Uh, a lot of times it's used in the terms of making sure that you have a balanced network that accommodates all modes. Uh, but for the department that I run, where I have uh, a cadre of engineers and planners and two-thirds of my staff and actual operational folks, it is important uh, that we kind of simplify what equity means. And so for our department, we have really been working on a clear-cut definition of what really equity is about. And equity is really based in justice, and justice is about identifying a remedy for some type of wrongdoing that has happened in the past. And so in order for our department, who are responsible for making sure we build out all of our infrastructure, we fundamentally want to make sure that the people, the areas, and the assets in Denver that need the most help receive the most attention. That's the fundamental thing that we have uh, that uh, undergirds all of our equity work in the mobility space. And so we all know that transportation has been uh, one of the factors that one, can not only connect people and provide access for folks, uh, but over the decades, especially in this country, has been used to separate and divide communities. And we are embarking on a different approach here that has the behest of the leadership of the mayor, as well as our department, to make sure that as we move forward with new projects that we are considering everybody uh, in those impacted areas, and regardless of the mode that you choose to be able to get around, you should be able to do so in an efficient and safe uh, and reliable manner. And that's what we're gonna focus on, and we're excited to hear from 
the panelists today and making sure that we learn something today. And we take that back as public servants and make sure that we implement those types of ideas and make our city better. And you may be able to hear something today uh, as you will go back to your locales uh, that you can implement to make uh, your locations much better. Uh, the last thing I would like to mention, uh, although we're very focused on making sure our mobility infrastructure meets the needs of everybody, uh, regardless of age, from 8 to 80, to regardless of how well you get around, uh, regardless of your income status, uh, we want to make sure that our infrastructure is built out to make it a safe environment for people to be able to get around. So just to give you some statistics of what we're doing here in Denver around safety and what uh, we have here in Denver is an adopted plan back in 2017 called Vision Zero, which is trying to drive down uh, the number of traffic deaths to zero uh, by the year 2030. And right now, uh, we uh, have experienced 58 people who have died in our city streets. Uh, last year, we all of last year, all of 2018, we had 64. We have four months left, and we are, we are almost uh, at the same amount that we had in all of last year. And so as we move forward in building out an equitable city, keep in mind that we need to do uh, it in a manner that protects all of our vulnerable users. And in Denver, 5% of our roadways contribute to about 40% of the fatalities. And many of those fatalities are, are, are on roadways that we consider high injury network roads, uh, which if you look at a map, it borders all of the uh, underserved areas in our, in our city. And so equity and understanding what it means is extremely important. Tying it back to how you build out your infrastructure and make sure people be able to get around in an efficient manner is important. The most important thing and the number one priority for our city, as well as our department, is to make sure people are operating safely. So, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to provide some remarks, give some context to the city and county of Denver, and I'm looking forward to the remarks on the panel. And uh, all of the other conversations that are going on is a part of this particular event. So, thank you very much. so much for that context and you know everybody I hope no, by now knows that the theme of this year's festival is empathy and action and we specifically picked action because we think that empathy is so obviously something that we need to work on today but we really want to lean toward action so those contextualized and compact com comments were extremely helpful and what we are asking of all of you today is once we've had a chance to hear from the panelists maybe during the Q&A session Think about what that means in our community, right? What is this information that we're learning today? How can we implement it? How can we make those suggestions to public works? Or we can have a whole session on the scooters alone, right? But you know, we'd really love it if you'd help us lean toward action and make those comments, suggestions, and you know, make sure that this information does not go to waste because that's really what we're we're hoping that when you will come out, you will get out of the biennial today. So we are deputizing all of you along with your host for today. Who I'm going to turn it over to now. Um, to my left is Eugene Howard from the Denver Office of Community Planning and Development, and he's going to be our moderator today. Thank you so much. Thank you. So maybe that didn't quite work out so well. Let's see if this will stay. So, Finica, number four, yes, welcome, and thank you for coming uh, and joining us today. Um, as you've already heard, my name is Eugene Howard. I'm a senior city planner with uh, Community Planning and Development, and I will be moderating this fantastic panel. We have some amazing guests joining us today uh, with all sorts of uh, national, international experience uh, and a depth and breadth of uh, knowledge they're going to share with us today. So I think that there are opportunities for us to come away with a great deal of new information, uh, new ideas, and ways to get out there and motivate our elected officials into action. So um, I'm really excited to introduce our panel. I'm going to very quickly give you sort of some brief highlights of each individual that's here joining us today. Um, I will ask if you wouldn't mind holding your applause until we get through the introductions, and then we will turn it over to them to share with us a little bit more about themselves and the current work that they're doing. So, um, I'm going to start with my immediate left, and um, pardon my pronunciations if I don't quite get them right, but uh, Clarice Cunyalinke uh, has been involved in planning and implementation of social policies and programs in Brazil since 2001. She has worked in her home country of Brazil. She's also worked in Mozambique and Namibia. Clarice is an educator, an avid promoter of women's rights, 
a supporter of environmental justice, and her efforts in trans and mobility has earned her numerous awards, too many to, to go into. So uh, welcome, Clarissa, and thank you for joining us. Uh, next to Clarissa, we have Eline Calavante. I'm welcome. Keep working on that. Uh, she's a journalist, a visionary, an international bicycle advocate, and it also happens to be the subject of an award-winning documentary, Bikes Versus Cars. Aline is currently the Public Relations and Founder of Climate Change and Active Mobility Coalition, the Director of Public Participation and Ciclocidade, which is an urban cyclist association in Sao Paulo. And, on top of everything else, she is a regional counselor at UCB, the Brazilian Union of Cyclists. So, welcome. Thank you for coming. All right. Moving down the line, we have Sean Hertel. Sean is a Toronto-based uh, urban planner with over 20 years of experience. He started at a very young age. Uh, he's also a lecturer with uh, Ryerson University and the University of Waterloo. Sean brings a breadth of experience from many disciplines, including regional uh, municipal planning, development, transportation, housing, journalism, and social equity. He has a multitude of letters after his last name. And one little tidbit, according to a Canadian website uh, that is monitored and uh, provides information on lecturers by students, Sean has a 4.4 rating for his lecture. Um, and at the end there, we've got a Robin Matsumi. Robin is a thought leader a spokesperson for the work that we're going to talk about today, an advocate, a change maker, and a future doctor of cognitive neuroscience that he's seeking from the University of Waterloo. Robin has been studying the psychological impacts of our built environment uh, using some, a, a multitude of tools, but most recently virtual reality and wearable technology. His inspiration, as I understand it, comes from his experience working as a mental health occupational therapist. He has numerous articles and interviews and publications to his name, and he has a great deal of research that he'll be sharing with us today. So with that, I ask you all to give a warm, fantastic biennial of the Americas welcome to our panelists. So in our preparation for today, we thought it would be a good idea to make sure that we were all on the same page with two key definitions uh, related to mobility and the definitions of equity. So consulting the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, mobility is defined as the quality or state of being mobile or movable, the ability to change one's social or socioeconomic position in a community, and especially to improve that condition. And I think it's that last part of that definition that is really important to the conversation that we will have today. And for each of us to think about as we go back into our lives, uh, looking for opportunities to affect a meaningful change. Uh, the definition of equity is justice according to natural law or right. Specifically, and I think this is key, the freedom from bias and the freedom of favoritism. And what I think is important about that is really when we look at our built environment, there are decisions that have been made for each and every one of us, uh, whether we would have made those decisions or not. So what are we favoring in our built environment? What are we favoring when it comes to transportation and land use? And how might we work to make all of those decisions more equitable to more people? So with that, I want to start us off with my very first question. Uh, and for our panel, um, I wanted to make sure to share with you that Denver and the region has started to really have more intentional conversations around equity. And what does it mean to really embed equity in the work that we do as city officials? So, um, thinking about how equity is showing up in our plans and policies, please, uh, if you don't mind, in order here, tell us a little bit about what equity means to you in the countries where you work and the work that you're doing. Yes. Well, okay, thank you. Um, so I, yeah, um, 
I don't know if we can go to the, can we go to the slides? Uh, should I go here with a clicker? I can do it too if you like. Um, I will have to pass, I think. Should I do that? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so I think it's going to be easy here if I just show some images and, and then I can answer this. I think, first of all, thank you very much for, for being here, for inviting me. It's interesting to be here in a panel with another Brazilian and with a person that I respect a lot with two Canadians and with Ameri an American in Denver, which, by the way, is an amazing city. But I think it, the, it, it just uh, brings something that is important for me to say, which is don't take for granted that reality is the same everywhere. So I think this is very important because this, in many cases in Brazil, is the reality of our mobility and of the way that people move, right? Uh, and we are talking about this. Although most of you would know uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, the South Zone, Ipanema, Copacabana, that's not where the majority of the population lives. And sometimes we have this reality even very close to these areas. So I think this is the first point, is that equity means very different, uh, different things depending on your reality. And here in terms of mobility and connecting mobility to equity, uh, I like to understand mobility as a lever of access. I think Amarsha Sen did that very well in a way of explaining to us how, how we can have different, different levers that really help us flourish in our society as a community or as, as individuals. Right? So I understand mobility as being a lever for us to access service, employment, education, health, participation as well. But again, it will depend on who you are in which society you are and what are really the, the parameters in the society that qualify you. And in the Brazilian case, it, there, there are many different uh, parameters and I think here it would be the same, like your income, your gender, but I would say up and, and uh, like above all, race. So we talk very little about that in Brazil, about our racial inequality, but this is really one of the main um, I would say, uh, parameters that defines your access to the city and that defines what, what in fact uh, you are entitled to access. And mobility can be a lever for empowerment and a lever for access, but it can also be something that perpetuates inequality. I think this is very clear for us um, when you're talking about cities that are spatially segregated, right, that we define who has a priority where we define that the priority for the government until now is much more about protecting property rather than protecting our, our rights to move in the city. So the most, I think this photo is very, uh, very meaningful in this way, right? We put people on the street because we are protecting the building, we are protecting the cars. Um, and when we see that, in fact, our city has been growing, uh, still maintaining a lot of inequity in the social, spatial, inequality. So here's the map of Sao Paulo, uh, where Alini comes from, the, the, it's this dog, you see the white part, it's like a dog, a, a face of a dog, this is Sao Paulo, and the, the purple mark, the purple uh, wave, uh, heat wave, uh, sorry, heat mark, I don't know how to say that in English, is where um, employment is, formal employment, and the yellow and the green, the, the yellow and red dots are where the lower uh, income population leaves. So we see that there is a very uh, serious spatial mismatch here and that mobility can either improve it uh, or it can per perpetuate this inequality, this, uh, this, this difficult to access work uh, and maybe for us to say the best mobility plan is in fact a land use plan because there is no mobility solution that can really address this problem, right? It's still demanding a lot on the population. And here, just another example as well, this is Rio, and you see three maps of Rio, and you see the, uh, the time to access employment, so the, the amount of employment that is available to you. In 30 minutes, you see the black map, almost nothing. Uh, in 60 minutes, you can already see something here, which is in the city center and south zone, the areas you know about Rio, and in 90 minutes. So if you look at the extreme west zone, this is where 27% of the population live. Not even in 90 minutes, they can access a decent amount of work with public transport. So we're talking about extremely serious, and if we look at this population, this is another map of Rio, 
uh, which more or less tells you the same story, the transit sheds, so the coverage of public transport system, right? If we look at uh, per income rate, uh, per income brackets, 23% of the low income population is covered, but 55% of the higher income population. So we are delivering, uh, even when we're delivering infrastructure, we are not really managing to analyze uh, where the population is, what sort of access they need. And when we make, we have been trying to put these maps in terms of gender and race as well. So I don't have the map here, but I can tell you 55% of the high income population has access, but only 32% of, of black women. So when you, you, you go down, putting all these different layers, you can see who is in fact uh, more distant and have less access. I also want to bring here just a discussion about the bus system, which even in the cities where we have big uh, rail system, the, most of the population is in fact in the bus. We don't have any city in Brazil that has more than 5% of the streets, of the roads uh, with priority to bus. So this is also another aspect of equity that I think we need to discuss, right? Especially if we want to get people out of cars, how do we, we qualify the public transport system in all its different uh, uh, services, and I think speed uh, is one. And there is another, uh, almost coming to the end here, about equity, but here when we try, when we start understanding what are the different realities that different groups experience in transport. So we have this recent uh, survey now in Brazil that shows 97% of women have been harassed already on public transport, or even on taxis and, and Ubers and other uh, services like that. So uh, also, how much are we demanding from a woman who has to be two hours in a bus to access work in a place that where she's very likely to be harassed? So this is also about justice, and I think about all it's about empathy, because we think planning transport is neutral in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of income, but we need to understand what are really the inequities in the country, in the Brazilian country, and I suppose in the US as well. This is a, a graph uh, uh, that is very, uh, it, it belongs to most of our countries, right? My experience as a white woman, I'm a woman, I have an experience different from a man, but it's most likely more similar to an experience of a white man than of an experience of a black woman in Brazil. So I think empathy is also a lot about bringing all these different voices to the table and, uh, and give visibility as much as possible to the experience that all these different groups uh, experience uh, and, face daily in their difficulty to access the city and to access all the wonderful opportunities that the city in theory have to offer, but they, that we don't really offer to all equally. So I guess this is a very long answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Inga. Boa tarde. Todas e a todos. Vou dar um tempinho para vocês ligarem o tradutor. É, muito obrigada pelo convite ao evento da Bienal das Américas. Estou muito feliz de estar aqui hoje. Vou falar em português porque eu me sinto mais confortável para trazer toda a complexidade que o tema exige. Então, a sua pergunta sobre o que é equidade. Foi muito bom ouvir a Clarice falar um pouquinho do Brasil no começo, porque eu vou focar meus esforços na política cicloviária da cidade de São Paulo. É, São Paulo é uma cidade que tem cerca de 11 milhões de habitantes, só na capital. Então, a gente está falando de uma mega cidade. E com todo, todas as questões urbanas, de moradia, gentrificação, que nós também passamos muito por isso, desigualdade social, o transporte, ele se torna um, um tema de profunda, de, de manifestação da profunda desigualdade social que a gente vive. Então, é o um tema dos transportes que a gente vê refletida a desigualdade social na rua. 
no acesso das pessoas às cidades e as oportunidades que a cidade oferece. Então, a gente tem hoje no Brasil cidades que oferecem diferentes oportunidades para diferentes pessoas. As pessoas elas não recebem todas a mesma chance de sobreviver e de viver dignamente. Quando a gente começou a trabalhar com bicicleta de uma forma mais estruturada, mais política, há mais ou menos 10 anos atrás, a gente não esperava, muito porque éramos um movimento jovem é, na cidade de São Paulo, mas também por é isso, falta de experiência, a gente não imaginava que as ciclovias e ciclofaixas fossem ser o um exemplo de uma política pública de inclusão social. Quando a gente começou o trabalho com as bicicletas, com as ciclovias, a gente só queria chegar vivo em casa. A gente só queria ter um pouco do espaço urbano para ter o direito de ir e vir. E durante alguns anos, o nosso movimento ele foi conhecido como um movimento elitizado. Um movimento que surge de uma classe média é, e que exige o direito de pedalar como se fosse algo quase chique. Porque a experiência que a gente tem aqui na Europa, Estados Unidos, quem usa bicicleta é quem mora muito perto do trabalho e é privilegiado. Nos países do sul global, da América Latina, a gente tem uma outra realidade. A bicicleta está muito conectada com a classe pobre porque é um veículo barato. Então, estima-se que o Brasil tem 70 milhões de bicicletas. Mas essas bicicletas elas estão cada vez mais marginalizadas por políticas públicas de rodoviarização do país. Então, as cidades menores, as pequenas e as médias cidades, hoje sofrem com intensas políticas de incentivo ao uso do carro e de motos. Então, você vê cidades pequenas que tem muito uso de bicicleta no Brasil hoje, migrando para moto. É, e, e, voltando para São Paulo, quando a gente começou a trabalhar com o tema da bicicleta, a gente fez reuniões em todas as su subprefeituras, que são como é, prefeituras regionais. A cidade de São Paulo tem 32 subprefeituras. É como se fossem 32 pequenas cidades em São Paulo. Fizemos reuniões em todas elas para tentar mapear o uso da bicicleta e os interesses de quem usava a bicicleta nessas regiões. Descobrimos que tem subprefeitura que o uso da bicicleta é equiparado ao uso da Europa, de cidades europeias. Existe uma periferia da cidade de São Paulo, chamada Jardim Helena, que as pessoas usam mais bicicleta do que em Amsterdã. Mas elas não têm a mesma segurança, elas não têm a mesma visibilidade, elas não têm o mesmo respeito do que a Amsterdã. Então, quando a gente, o, a gente percebeu que implementar a infraestrutura cicloviária, ela exige coragem política, porque não é técnico o problema. A gente tem muitos dados, muitos números que demonstram o papel da bicicleta na, na matriz de mobilidade. Mas a gente, muitas vezes, não tem políticos interessados nessa agenda. Então, o último prefeito da cidade de São Paulo conseguiu implementar 400 quilômetros de infraestrutura cicloviária. Majoritariamente na região central de São Paulo, que é uma região mais rica, que, onde está a classe média. Poucas estruturas na periferia, que curiosamente é onde tem mais uso de bicicleta. E o efeito disso foi avassalador para a cidade inteira. Hoje as ciclovias elas não são só para ciclistas. A gente tem leis que autorizam catadores de material reciclado a usarem ciclovias, cadeirantes, skatistas e pedestres. Então são espaços de cidadania, eu diria. E sempre que eu mostro essas fotos dos eventos onde eu participo, uma vez na Europa me falaram, olha, aqui também as pessoas usam ciclovia para cadeira de rodas ou para caminhar. Mas a grande diferença é que a gente não tem calçada. As pessoas fazem isso porque não tem outro espaço para se deslocar. Então, as ciclovias acabaram se tornando o 
quase o único espaço onde é possível acessar a cidade, as oportunidades da cidade sem ter um carro. Porque a cidade já foi feita para quem tem carro. 80% do é dedicado para quem tem carro. E quem tem carro em São Paulo é 30% da população. Então, a gente tem hoje 30% da população ocupando 80% do viário. Os outros 20% a gente divide entre transporte coletivo, calçadas e ciclovias. Então, para passar para os próximos, eu acho que o que eu queria falar sobre a equidade é que, para mim, tá, para a gente, no movimento da bicicleta em São Paulo, ficou muito conectado com justiça. Com justiça, com democracia, com acessibilidade, com oportunidades. Então, o que era para ser uma política pública de inclusão de ciclistas na matriz de transporte da cidade, se tornou uma política pública de inclusão social. E talvez esse seja o motivo pelo qual ela não tem avançado mais. O prefeito atual está há três anos na gestão e ele não avança com essa política, porque setores ricos não querem ter pobres nas suas, na frente das suas casas, na frente dos seus trabalhos. Então, mais do que é uma questão de mobilidade, é uma questão social, que envolve preconceitos e que envolve aí outras questões que não são só técnicas. Então, para começar, acho que é um pouco isso. Obrigada mais uma vez. Um, before we go on to hear from Sean, I want to just remind our audience and anyone listening online that this session is being streamed live on Facebook Live. So the Biennial is the, the page. So please share that, like it, make sure that many of us uh, that are not able to be here today are able to join and participate in this conversation. So thank you both very much for sharing and we're going to hear from Sean. You guys didn't hear that. Thank anymore. you very much. I don't have many slides. My students always groan when I say that because that means they have to listen to me. <laughs> so I think that 4.4 uh, rating was uh, that's a surprise to me. So it's it's great. Um, I just wanted to remind, I guess, remind myself, and sometimes it's good to remind ourselves that the modern civil rights movement in North America began on a public transit bus over 60 years ago with Rosa Parks refusing, because of the color of her skin, to sit at the back of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And I, I think that sort of the, the fact that it happened on transit is very provocative and should mean something. And I, and I think maybe we, we need to remind ourselves of the, the power both positive and negative about public transit. Because two things. I think public transit is a public good. It should be, not just transportation, it's infrastructure, but it's infrastructure inherently for the public good. And also I think it, it, it engenders, it, it fo focuses us, compels us, I think, to ask the question, who is the public in public transit? And I think that we sort of oversimplify, and I don't think we mean to, I think we're all generally well-intended. Even I have to catch myself as, a, as an academic studying transportation and transportation planning, and as a practitioner, I think it should almost say public transit, although it would sound a little awkward, but I think we have to understand that we may not be planning for the same public we think we are, because we think that, uh, well, the public is the public. Well, in Toronto, for example, where I come from, you know, Toronto is heralded as this great shiny city uh, on a hill for our diversity. Uh, but uh, we, we do a lot uh, wrong. And we have a lot of problems that, you know, Sao Paulo and Rio and Denver are grappling with in other cities. Uh, because I think that um, wealth and race could still be, despite our best intentions, predictors of the quality and the level of service of our public transit. So unfortunately, um, this is done by the brilliant demographer uh, David Wolshansky from the University of, of Toronto. You can see that, you see our, our, our best transit spine 
north, south, east, west. That's our, our transit, our, our subway system. And the blue is the highest, um, the highest income groups. And the red is the lowest income groups. So guess what, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen? The highest income groups are, are clustered around the highest order of transit. And the lowest income groups are uh, in what, what uh, Richard Florida at the Rockman Institute at UT calls uh, transit deserts. So again, you can almost predict, based on race, uh, based on income, even in a place like Toronto, right, where the level of service is and how well you are serving, quote, the public, right? Because you have a rich public who, ironically, uh, doesn't often take transit. Right? So who are we planning for? <laughs> right? And then you have the poor, which, which planners ostensibly say that, well, we want to provide them with options. We want to provide captive riders with, with dignity and with mobility and predictability uh, so that they aren't second and third class citizens. Uh, like like in, in, in many places, especially in the global south. Um, but that's not, what, that's not what's happening. So, that's all I wanted to show you, but I just want to say how I came. I've always liked to think of myself as a good person, as a good lefty, as, a, as someone who was kind of a bleeding heart, hugging person. But I'll tell you, I didn't come to empathy easily. Um, and there are, two, there are two ways I kind of stumbled into it. And that's the crux of, I think, the issue that we have to talk about. Is that despite how I, despite me thinking I'm a good person and will use my privilege wisely as an academic, and as a practitioner, I, I realized that I wasn't even asking the right questions. Two things prompted the change. Um, I did a lot of, uh, and still do, a lot of subway planning, and I was called into a finance meeting uh, at Metrolinx, which is Toronto's uh, uh, public transit agency at a regional level, and called into a business, uh, a business case analysis meeting for a new line that was about five and a half billion dollars of Canadian or, you know, 100,000 US, whatever, <laughs> dollars, kind of bad these days. So, thanks for laughing, I appreciate that. And, and we had, you know, a tax, uh, a return on investment, number of development uh, applications, uh, the number of people we could move uh, per hour. But one thing missing was social impact. And I'm thinking, if we build transit for any reason, shouldn't social impact be at the top of the list? And they looked at me like I said I enjoy the taste of baby meat or something ridiculous, right? They, that was very controversial, right? Well, what do you mean? Like, they honestly didn't get it. And secondly, uh, which is very profoundly personal uh, to me, um, it was January 7th, 2014, I remember the day. It was uh, 5.30 in the morning, uh, very cold, cold, stereotypical, Toronto, um, Canada morning. It was about minus 35 Celsius. It's cold. Uh, and I was um, taking the bus uh, to be interviewed on a radio show about uh, what I thought the, the top five challenges were facing Toronto for the new year. And this bus was very silent in the snow and crept up and I got on and I felt like it was in a dream because there was a lot of moisture and condensation the doors opened, and I walked in, and I couldn't get very far. The bus was absolutely packed. And it was packed with women, and women of color. And not only was I the only male, but I was the only white person on the bus. And I could just see it in their faces. It was 5.30 in the morning, and many of them probably got on that bus at least maybe an hour ago, coming from a lot of the red areas on the map, and the bus was picking me up in the blue area of the map. And it really stuck in me. It, it really made this idea of equity, of fairness, and what the hell I was doing as a transportation planner, it made it very personal. And, I, and I'm glad I had that experience. Now, now the question is, what am I going to do with it? Right? What should we do with it? Now me, like a, 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 a good, well-intentioned idiot, I went to the, <laughs> continued on the bus to the subway, went downtown to the studio, and did I mention that experience? No, I didn't. I didn't. Maybe I was still processing it. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to come up with excuses. 
but I did use that experience, and one last slide, I guess, quickly, is my colleagues and I at York University came up with this. Uh, we got a grant to study transit equity. Equity is something that should be deliberately planned for, deliberately appropriated uh, from our scarce public investments in transit. And I dare say I do think it has made a bit of a difference in the way that we prioritize project planning in our, in our investments in Toronto, but it's still a fight. And so we have to, and I urge all of us to remind ourselves who our public is, who are we planning for, who has power and who needs it, right? Who has power, who has influence. And I think the more that we think of people, faces, moving through spaces, the more we humanize the experience, the more real it will be. So they're just not a color on a map, like literally and figuratively. They're people. There are people, there are brothers and sisters. And if we can make that a very intimate connection, then I think that we can do some good. But part of it is just asking the right questions in the first place. Thank you. All right, Robin. Yes, the question was, what is equity? Okay. Yeah, what does it mean in the work that you do? Oh, yeah, I'll give some context for that. So, I mean, fundamentally, I think equity is about people having the opportunity and the resources to participate in things that are meaningful to them. Um, and I think that would go the same for mobility for the team. So, definition for both those things would be around people being able to have some choice um, to engage in. Uh, activities, uh, communities that provide meaning to their life. And uh, the way that I came to understand equity from that perspective was informed by um, my clinical experience working as a mental health occupational therapist. So I did that for about five years. Um, and occupational therapists are, I guess, dist distinguished um, in, healthcare, in the healthcare world and that we pay particular attention to the environment. And so we understand, we use the social model of disability to understand illness, so uh, whereas the medical model of disability will locate um, an illness um, or dysfunction in the person and treat the person, the social model of disability sees disability as a product of a disabling environment. So we don't see disabled people, we see disabled environments. And using that kind of framework, we go out and work with people with uh, all sorts of uh, health issues, and I focus mostly on, on mental health. And um, so I worked in Toronto at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health on a schizophrenia inpatient unit where I worked with acutely psychotic people to get them from the inpatient unit back in the community. And oftentimes these people were living under the poverty line. Uh, had, there was all sorts of other intersectional aspects to their experience in the city. And then I moved to Edmonton, which is uh, Canada's largest, most northern city. Uh, there was about a million and a half people living there. And I worked on a team there that was focused on helping people with challenging behaviors or complex needs. And this is a multi-system initiative where we had justice, we had um, mental health, we had uh, the Ministry for People with Disabilities all coming together to work with this group of very um, high needs or um, free, we call them frequent flyers because they come in either to the jail or the hospital almost like every day. And it costs the system like a lot of money. And the way that they, the reason they're, they're, they're labeled as having challenging behaviors is that they got really physical people. Oftentimes there were some language uh, barriers or communication barriers, and so the way that they would communicate that their needs weren't being met or that they assault their caregivers, uh, paid or unpaid. And so I spent two years working on this team, and uh, regardless of the laundry list of diagnoses that these people had, the most detrimental issue that I saw that they faced was uh, loneliness. And there was one client um, I had that the psychiatrist recommended me to go work with him because he said, you know, you're the occupational therapist, um, you're focused on meeting, this guy might, might not have any meeting in his life because he tried killing himself yesterday. And I went to go see him and being the occupational therapist with the environmental kind of uh, perspective on health, you know, first I said, you know, why did you try to take your life? And he's like, I'm lonely, I don't have any friends. And so, I said, okay, well, let's look at your community. Where can we find people for you to connect with? And typically, people with developmental disabilities in Edmonton live in, uh, live in, live in boarding homes where there's five or six people stuffed into a house. These homes are run by private organizations that exploit these people who have a consistent 
coming in for your, for your accommodation. And the other one, a fringe of the city, so not really in the central areas. And so I went up for a walk with him around his community, and I saw like very, very little opportunity for him to connect with people. There was no good public space. Um, there was no rec centers, no libraries. Transit was terrible, and um, to get from where he was to the core by just be like a suicide mission. You know, like it just wasn't safe. So um, I saw. I mean, I guess equity and mobility, or mobility particularly for this person, um, as the biggest inhibitor to his well-being, um, or the absence of, of options to get out of his community, which probably from an, from an urban design perspective should have been designed better. And that's actually what led me to quit my job. I just got burned out by seeing this constantly. Um, and, uh, and then I spent a year working, running a, a startup accelerator, which I wasn't really trained to do. And in the process, I got Part of the, the learning um, uh, or the training was to do a course in design thinking with the Stanford D School, and there they talked about empathy and empathy being that should have why it should be at the core of the design process, whether you're designing a product or an experience for a city, like empathize with the users. And I really realized that people I spent five years working with were really empathized with when it came to what their needs were from what a city you should provide them, and so that led me. To quit that job, tricks around understanding the first person experience in the city. Anyways, that's a bit of like a context. I just want to provide the lens I have on these issues. But again, I think equity is really about providing people with the opportunities and the, the choice to participate. I think I prefer equity over inclusion because inclusion requires people to participate if they don't want to, and there's a power dynamic. But I think equity is about hey, if you want to participate, resources and you know you want to. Great, thank you. So we've heard a lot about empathy in the work that you all do. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, loud voices that are trying to participate and direct the decisions that we make. So I would like to ask each of you uh, to, to share with us how you go about advocating for the the marginalized individuals in your communities, those with less power, less socioeconomic capital. So how do you go about being an advocate for those whose voices are, are not as strong? Well, um, being a Is in fact how we engage with 
forget that even when we are not active in that space, remember that nobody can be left behind. There has to be an urban justice as well, so that nobody is left behind and how to add this to our life. Thank you. It was a really simple question. Thank you. <laughs> so for the next 97 minutes, I'd like to I think the first thing about equity is to realize that you can take this just like a tax just one day and you can spend that money on the next thing that you don't have to do it. So if we can make uh, equity possible in this community, I don't think it is a huge amount of money. And I think it's a huge amount of appreciation for the people in the community.
in Texas to talk about technology as well. But if you don't have uh, a clear uh, intention or set of actions that aim at getting there in Texas, I don't think technology is going to go there. Um, so I, I want to give a quick word also about what Jacob is doing. Um, we have heard a lot about flood weather in the CFP. So the CFP is, is uh, dynamic. We have many blocks inside the city and outside the city. It's not as, I think we just have to spend some time now in the area of the bridge parade with what that has to do. So the CFP now is very interesting. Okay? So we've got two very uh, areas that are black infrastructure, right? But they are inside the city. They are somehow moving. They are born out of location. The flow is to a different place. Uh, but if you are in flood weather, regardless of the weather that you have here, and you start rate, right? You get the driver at rate two, and you rate the driver. So how do we uh, sort that out? It makes me think of one of the Black Mirror episodes. If you were helping us to find Right? Who is worth and who is not? Uh, we have spent a lot of time recently in Brazilian cities, in some Brazilian cities like Rio, where I'm from, talking about the e-scooters. We were talking about e-scooters earlier. Great, wonderful solution, can be really great. But an e-scooter in Rio costs about one dollar for 15 minutes. A person who came, and they are in, the, in very specific areas, in the city center, in the south zone. We say, okay, this is going to be for the last mile. This is where the destinations are, so it's not that we are not, I mean, the people who live in the periphery will use because that's their destination. They're going to do the last mile. But these people, most of them, have already taken either a subway or a train and a bus. Fare is not completely integrated. They have already spent $2, $2, one way to arrive to work. Are they going to spend one dollar more? This is going to be three dollars, three US dollars, one trip. This is a lot, right? So, but this is the main business of the day. In everybody's agenda is to decide how we're going to regulate the e-scooters. Is it great to have e-scooters? It's great to have e-scooters. Is it going to sort the problem of mobility and equity in our city? No, it's not. We should regulate e-scooters, but we are really wasting a lot of time Why we should be, in fact, thinking how we're going to sort the problem of 2 million people who enter in the city of Rio daily, who spend all this amount of money to access work, most of them informal work, so they don't have their transportation costs covered by the employers. And the last point, which I think is also it has to do with the electrification agenda and with an agenda that is very, it's becoming really trendy in the cities and we need to understand how we're going to deal with that. It's a great agenda which has to do with mobility pricing. I think it's great if, if we start having uh, low emission zones or no emission zones and, and we, strike, we start to revise the circulation of, uh, uh, of the polluting vehicles. That's great. But the cost of an electric vehicle in Brazil, it's, I mean, it's impossible to buy. It's really extremely much more expensive than a polluting vehicle. So if we start to, to delimitate the flow of people, the way people circulate in a country where the circulation of specific groups has already been limited, right? where we have the black community living more in the periphery, where a country that is extremely violent, a country where we are killing, in the city where we are killing lots of people daily now. I think many of you heard in the morning uh, the, the presentation from Teresa that mentions, you know, we have black kids uh, being killed because there is a, a big intervention happening in our city. Now we're going to put into it another layer is this population gonna flow easily in the city? No, they're not going, they're not going to flow easily in the city. And we are putting it in the bill of because we don't want polluting vehicles. The, the low income population are not going to be capable of having electric vehicles, and the low income population does not have public transport with quality to circulate in the city. How are we going to do that? 
So I think it is crucial for us to talk about uh, climate change, having low, uh, low uh, emission cities, right? Low emission zones and cities uh, in, in, in the wide uh, aspect of it. But how does that define who circulates in which area people circulate? So I think it's a rights-based debate that we have here and that it tends to get very technical and in a way that will again perpetuate the inequalities that we have on the ground and give it a stamp that it is clean. And just a parenthesis, there is one city in Brazil, I'm not going to say the name of the city, but I can tell you after if you want. The low income, the low, the low emission zone area they are creating in the city center is going to be called white area. Area Branca, the white area. The Secretary of Transport said that in an event recently. Because of pollution. Because of pollution in a country like Brazil. Now that shocks me and I think that tells a story, right? And I think it's crucial that we try to understand how is technology going to really help us deal with this problem or in our society and who is not. So I'm, I'm not very fond of this. Thank you. Other panelists? Technology. Friend or foe? Um, I think both. I, I mean, um, as a neuroscientist, I'm really fascinated by neural nets and AI and deep learning. Um, and I think, you know, traditionally, a lot of cities, the like transit networks around privilege and giving people an easy way to get to places they want to get, or go, or um, stop people from getting to where they are. Like in Washington, like in Georgetown, hold, um, a subway line out there because they didn't want certain people in the neighborhood. Anyway, so I think that, I think what technology offers us is access to data where the people are and where they need to go. And we can use, you know, uh, sophisticated deep learning methods to, to really optimize a network that meets people's needs and understands what those frequencies are. But at the same time, uh, we have to be conscious of the bias that's in data. You know, there's a lot of talk right now about conscious and big data, uh, bias and in, in big data, um, and an interesting kind of example is I was talking to a, a transportation engineer at a conference, I can't remember which one, and they were getting really excited about using Strava data. And so Strava, for people who may not know, is like, I went for a ride and I made a Facebook post about it, and you, you know, you share your bike ride or how fast you went or whatever. Um, and typically, imagine who uses that kind of technology, and so this transportation engineer said that they were really excited that they were finally doing some data-driven planning and they would use that to figure out what the cycling infrastructure is. And it's fascinating to me because a lot of these people are actually vehicular uh, recreational cyclists and the city was thinking we're developing infrastructure based on data provided by these people and I'm like, go look around and who's using most bikes in the city they are actually people living under the parking line, visibly homeless, um, they don't have Strava. <laughs> they need to be safe on the roads and we should be about what their needs are, but because they don't have the technology to participate, they, they're completely silenced. So I think there's some really great opportunities in terms of democratizing um, what transit can be and, and using actual data to drive it, but how that data is collected, I think, is going to be really important. Thank you. Technology has helped a lot in the consultas populares, digamos assim mas a, nos ajudou muito a captar mais é, insights de, do planejamento cicloviário. Várias reuniões, a gente fez transmissão delas. Então, tudo bem que não é todo mundo que tem pacote de dados para a internet, ou que tem smartphone, ou que tem um computador, mas é possível que nas reuniões a gente consiga fazer transmissão delas, disponibilizar elas depois para que outras pessoas acessem. E isso é tecnologia. É, Para mim, o que está no centro da questão da tecnologia nas cidades são duas coisas. A primeira é a transparência desses dados. A gente tem o que é um bilhete do transporte coletivo, é, de fluxo de usuários, de usuários de bicicletas compartilhadas, de usuários de patinetes. A gente tem tido muita dificuldade para acessar os dados. E sem transparência nos dados, é muito difícil você fiscalizar uma política pública. E, tam 
também a questão da regulação, né? a regulamentação sobre a tecnologia, sobre novos veículos, novos... É, porque é, é fundamental que o interesse público ele esteja acima do interesse privado da empresa. A empresa ela faz uma tecnologia para o um público. Ela tem uma finalidade, ela tem fins lucrativos. Ela, a gente sabe que a inovação privada ela tem um, uma entrega e ela tem um, um público, né, um interesse. E, e nem sempre ele é o mesmo da necessidade real das cidades. Então, como que o Estado, a Prefeitura, o Governo, ele, ele vira o centro do planejamento dessa tecnologia? Não dá para deixar tudo na mão da iniciativa privada, que é o que tem acontecido em São Paulo. Em São Paulo, para vocês terem uma ideia, as empresas de bicicletas compartilhadas, de bike sharing e de patinetes, scooters, elas decidem onde elas vão colocar as estações. Então, naturalmente, naturalmente né, uma força do mercado, elas estão nas áreas nobres. E as áreas periféricas ficam sem esse serviço. Então, para mim, passa por quem faz a tecnologia, para quem faz a tecnologia, transparência de dados e manter o poder público no centro dessa discussão. Obrigado. I just want to say something very quick.
very difficult to find it. Uh, but this is a big concern uh, for, for women that we have been talking uh, to. Relatively few transportation hubs in Toronto even have an elevator, right, which inherently excludes people. In terms of washrooms, it is Toronto uh, Transit Commission policy, our TPC, that's our, our provider of subway and, and bus and streetcar service, to only put washrooms in terminal stations. So at our hub, Union Station, like in downtown Denver, in Lodo, um, oh, I'm learning the lingo, um, or at the, uh, the ends of the subway lines. So obviously, biologically, you know, we, we only have to go to the bathroom at the end of each subway line, right? So it's absolutely ridiculous. You know why? Because decisions are made by engineers, because it's more efficient to do that. Imagine if they actually asked their riders. Can you imagine that? So anyway, I get a little fired up about that, but it's so stupid. Right? It's an easy thing, guys. It shouldn't be this hard, right? That's very kind for being fired up. So we appreciate having you here for that. Yes, sir. There's a mic coming right behind you. Uh, yeah, I was interested in uh, Robin. You made the distinction between disabled environments and disabled people, uh, and I'm just curious about maybe the other panels had to say about how that would affect our planning of um, planning of cities. I thought about one example when Robin, I also uh, was very interested in this um, comment that he made and also the understanding that maybe this is technically wrong saying this way, but all of us in some moment in our lifetime, we have moments where we are more able or less able to move, right? Remember when I was pregnant twice, it was much more difficult, so I had limited mobility. Uh, and, and then in Brazil we got recently this data, the latest data from the census that our elderly population increased by 80%. So as in other countries we are becoming older, you know, uh, our pyramid is changing a lot. And we have been doing some analysis of crossing time uh, in the, for pedestrians to cross the streets. And we have been analyzing the able men crossing time, the able uh, women, the elder, elderly kids, and an adult with an elderly person with or with kids. And we have come to the conclusion that in the case of Sao Paulo, I don't have the exact numbers, but the speed that you demand for a person to cross the street is of an adult, an, an able adult, an, able adult men. So I think there is a lot about it that we can, and this is, this is the moment we get this data, it's clear to, it's easier to make it more visible, right? We say, look, it's virtually impossible for a person, for the majority of the population, in fact, to cross at this speed that you were demanding. Um, so I think it, it, it is very aligned with this idea that it, it is an, an environment that is not enabling us, in fact, and there was recently a, a talk I heard from a professor from the University of Nairobi, Winnie Mutala, and she said, uh, she, we were talking about children, right? And about designing, uh, uh, teaching children how to deal with the environment and then how we're missing the point, in fact, how we should be, in fact, so, so her, her, her phrase was something like, how teaching the kids to navigate in a, in a not enabling environment is missing the point. We should in fact be reviewing the way we make our city so that the kids can safely navigate through that. And we have spent a lot of time uh, trying to adjust the environment, uh, trying to adjust the kids' behavior, and I think it's the same for other groups as well. So I don't know the numbers in Brazil, but I do believe that this concept that we all go through moments even when we are not uh, quote unquote define as uh, with disabled mobility. We always go through go through moments like that and we will go at some we will arrive at that at some point. So how can we really re rethink redesign our our cities thinking about that? Can I just jump on that really quick side? So um, your point about kids being able to walk around the city safely just made me think about so you'd like to see disabling environments as 
barriers that are put in. But like, I think, I mean, the elephant in the room to me around transportation equity and, uh, and disabling environments is like car culture. And uh, like, I think one of the biggest causes of injuries and death to kids, I think in North America, was getting hit by a car. And so the environment itself can really cause disability. And I think um, talking about more sustainable, safer methods of getting around our cities also addresses the, the, the fact that vehicles cause a lot of injury and disability themselves. And so this, this line of conversation really fits nicely into the next topic I wanted to um, bring to the panel and to the audience as well. And that is around land use. Uh, and some of the work that I saw of yours, Robin, um, specifically around the super block, I believe in Barcelona, and how that space was sort of reclaimed and given back to people. Uh, and then some of the arguments around, was that a good idea? Aren't you gonna ruin business? And is that gonna be a negative? But I think I heard or read that it actually was a positive. And uh, Alina, I think your research as well, something about um, a particular street that was closed down and the concerns of the business owners that they were going to lose business, but in fact, the exact opposite. So if anyone wants to comment on land use and how we can better provide land and opportunities to people. Well, just quickly as a land use planner, <laughs> I'll say that uh, we do generally a bad job because we spend billions, literally billions of dollars that we don't have uh, on bike lanes. Well, maybe not so much in Toronto, we don't build enough of them, but uh, subways and, and other things. And we don't think about housing. We don't use the public land well enough. We don't leverage it. We just essentially give it away. And guess what's built? Higher end uh, residential and commercial uh, for the benefit of, of virtually um, uh, a very small segment of our population. So we should not give, quite literally, the public land away. We should keep it and maximize it to align with public interests. And to me, it's so simple. Like what I tell my students, planning is one thing, and planning is politics. Right? So how do, we, how do we get in there and co-opt it? How do we change the rules of the game? And we, we, we talk a good game about transit-oriented development and pedestrian-friendly development, but it's not reflected generally in our decisions and especially on our budget lines. In São Paulo, we have alguns examples. A Avenida Paulista is the principal avenida econômica hoje, talvez no Brasil, onde estão todas as grandes empresas, bancos. E os ciclistas, há 10 anos atrás, perceberam que uma das formas de chamar atenção da imprensa e do governo era a Avenida Paulista. E não porque a gente é importante para o governo, é porque a gente para o capital. A gente trava a circulação do dinheiro da cidade quando a gente trava a Avenida Paulista. Então, é diferente você fazer uma manifestação na Avenida da periferia ou na Avenida Paulista. E quando o prefeito anterior fechou a Avenida Paulista para os carros e abriu para as pessoas, ele fez essa política de abrir espaços públicos para pedestres e ciclistas, foi, ele foi muito atacado, muito atacado. A população não queria, falou que aquilo ia prejudicar hospitais, comércio, a ia ser horrível para a cidade e até hoje ela permanece, já é talvez a única política pública que permanece com muito vigor em São Paulo, porque nesses, nesses últimos quatro anos o comércio percebeu que melhorou o seu faturamento, porque de, é, especialmente aos domingos, que é quando você tem mais turistas na cidade, as pessoas querem viver ao ar livre na, ao final de semana e não tinha muitas opções. Então, a, essa, esse exemplo da Avenida Paulista é, vem demonstrando para a população de que muitas vezes é preciso experimentar coisas na cidade. Ainda que você não saiba se vai dar certo ou se vai dar errado, é preciso experimentar. Se der errado, a gente desfaz, mas se não tiver espaço para experiência na cidade, 
a gente nunca vai conseguir é, ter recursos para os espaços. Eu, eu acho que é, é um pouco nesse sentido. Can I make two, more, two comments? One is just about this that Aline is talking about, about this political fight, I think, over space, over uh, the space, especially on Sundays, that you know there is a possibility to resignify this space. Uh, and I think they need to show the population, to increase the population's repertoire. Does this work? work? Okay. Because I think, as you said, there is this elephant in the room, which is car culture, and people just think, nobody, oh, how, how are we going to do without car? They, we don't know anymore, right? When you, we are already, this is already too ingrained. So it's important that we test and that we show other possibilities and that we don't so much on all the modeling, because I think the engineers are obsessed about modeling and we need to model everything. And know sometimes we need to try and we need to, you know, activate this space different.
the last part of that question, wouldn't it be really good if heaven were here? Well, something is just like that. What do we do to take care of this stuff? So, magic wands and how do we take care of this stuff? Well, I think it's a good job. A good job magic wand is using the spirit of magic to take care of this stuff. That's a good job. Then you think that they do what we think and the reason I say these magic wands is because um, they don't make you laugh at all, but you just can't imagine them being like this. But they can take care of your mind and body. It's called the Magic Wand Test. Um, you can send it to the police and they'll come get you. Um, uh, and uh, you guys think that that would be a good kind of part of the modern story of Jesus? I think that that would be a good part of the modern story of Jesus. Um, you know, that's the difficult. I don't know. I was thinking about the magic uh, wand. Um, I, I would uh, I would have um, women, black women and children empowered to, uh, in the, uh, to make decisions independent or of where they came from. I feel that there, we need more diversity in the in decision making about uh, recharging. I ride my bike a lot. I love riding my bike. The bike to me is this meditation in movement. It's a moment when my, I, my negative energies, uh, I, I, I use them to turn the pedal. So I really enjoy riding my bike as a recharge uh, uh, mechanism and also I have a uh, three year old son and there's nothing more st stimulating than, than, than to, to, to um, see uh, how present a child can be in the moment and that teaches me a lot and teaches me that what, uh, what, what really matters um, like a uh, Children, my son, and my bike, and and also having uh, women and children um, that making process. Um, it's and to to end. Um, it's very difficult for us on Pico Forest. It's burning. Um, we are losing the forest. We are losing our indigenous people that are being killed. Um, black communities being attacked. 
and the country being assaulted and um, devastated, there's more important for us today than to end uh, deforestation in the Amazon and uh, to move anywhere because it seems like politicians don't care about maintaining life. Slow down and having a time to experience the different kind of organizations uh, in any field because the field offer us so much that they don't want what the city has to offer. They can encounter, they can encounter with the unknown, right? And knowing how to bring a way to so many unknown people and this is something that could be really beautiful and that's why we are afraid of this. Um,
उत्साहन Thank you. 